In this video, I'm going to give you an overview of the Greek verbal system, which is sections 18 and 19 in Hanson and Quinn's Greek, an intensive course, which is on pages 39 to 45. As we start to learn the Greek verb system with unit two, you're going to need to know some words to talk about verbs. And as we progress through learning all the things that Greek verbs can do, you're going to need some of this vocabulary to talk about what they're doing and how they are behaving in a sentence. So I'm going to go over each of these items and give you just a quick sort of heads up on everything that we are going to do. Do not panic. There's going to be lots of information here, but then we will slowly start to learn in detail individual things as we move through. So this is going to be the huge picture, most of which you won't need to know for a while. I'm going to start with person, which most verb forms have. Greek has first, second, and third person, as does English. First person is when the subject of a verb is the closest to the speaker. That is to say, I or we. Second person is a degree away from the speaker, so you or y'all. And third person is yet another degree away from the speaker, so he, she, or it, or they. You can see we're also already talking about number. Greek has singular, dual, and plural numbers. So in a verb form, um, it's going to have person and number. The singular forms here are I, you, and he, she, or it. And the plural forms are we, y'all, and they. Now, I am from the South and I teach my Greek classes in the South, and since English doesn't have a regular second person plural, I'm always going to use y'all to talk about second person plural verbs. And so you can get in that habit too, or use whatever your local variation is for second person plural. Now you'll see that Greek also has, in my list down there on the left, a dual. That is a number that's specifically for things that come in twos, like eyes or hands or sons of Atreus. But it's rare enough and distinct enough in context that you don't really need to learn it separately, and Hanson and Quinn doesn't teach it in the main body of the text. So you can find it in the appendix if you're curious what dual forms look like, but you won't be responsible in my classes for knowing those forms, and I won't be teaching them in the videos. Greek verbs also have tense. This is something that you might actually already be thinking about or already have been introduced to when you've talked about your own language or in other languages that you've learned. I'm going to spend a little time, though, talking about what tense actually is comprised of because it's going to introduce to you some linguistic jargon that is helpful for understanding the difference among the Greek tenses. So we're going to talk about time and aspect. Perhaps if you have thought about tense before, it's mostly about the time that you've thought. In other words, oh, something will happen or something did happen in the past, and you've thought about past time and the future and that sort of thing. Really, tense is comprised of both time and aspect. That is to say, how the verb is proceeding. Is it still going on? Is it over and done with? Has it been completed? Is it simply an action you're talking about in some sort of simple way? So let me explain a little bit more about that and give us a little bit of a box chart here. Present time is one of the three times we'll talk about. There's also future time and past time. That all kind of makes sense. You've probably thought about those things before. Greek and many languages are also concerned with aspect. There's simple aspect when you're simply talking about an action without any concern about its progress or not. Progressive repeated aspect when you want to make sure that 
people know that the action you're talking about went on for a long time or is still going on or got repeated lots of times. And there's also completed aspect. When what you're talking about is over and done with and you want to give some emphasis to the fact that it is completed. The tenses in Greek combine these two things and when you know what the time is and the aspect is, you'll know which tense to choose for Greek. So present time and simple aspect are the two factors of the present tense in Greek. You can translate that in English, I fall, we'll use fall as our example verb here. So simple statement of an action in the time that is now, in the present time. We also use the present tense in Greek for present time and progressive repeated aspect. English has a slightly different way of saying this. When we want to stress the fact that an action is ongoing, we use a different English word verb form, which would be, in this instance, I am falling. That tells you in English that that's still going on. Greek we'll use the same tense, the same verb form for both of those ideas and you will decide which English way to translate that by context. The combination of past time and progressive repeated aspect is the imperfect tense in Greek. And in English, that's most easily translated by I was falling or I used to fall, both of which indicate that an action happened in the past, that's the past time, but it went on for a long time, or that you did it over and over again sometime in the past. If you combine future time and simple aspect, you get Greek's future tense. So, I will fall. No real emphasis one way or another on whether that action is ongoing or over with, but it's happening in the future time. So, I will fall is uh, future time and simple aspect. Future tense in Greek also does progressive repeated aspect in the future and so although English has a different way to stress the continuing nature of that action in the future I will be falling, Greek doesn't have a separate way and both of those ideas are translated by the future tense in Greek and context would tell you the difference. If we do present time and completed aspect, in other words, from the point of view of now, something is over and done with, what we get is the Greek perfect tense. And that is translated in English as I have fallen. So from the point of view of now, I have already fallen. It is over and done with. And I'm going to just take a second here to remind you that all this stuff I'm telling you right now is just giving you a picture of the whole system. You are going to learn some of these things very soon, but others of these things you will not learn for a while and you don't have to memorize all of this now. And I will remind you of all of it when we get to the forms for each of these t tenses. Okay, let's go on. Past time and completed aspect means from the point of view of some time in the past, an action is completed. In English, we do this with um, the helping verb had. So, I had fallen tells you that some time ago, I had already fallen. It was over and done with from the point of view of some time in the past. If you combine past time and simple aspect, no emphasis on completion or progression or repeatedness, you get the simple past which is aorist in Greek. So that's probably a new term for you. You'll get used to it because it's very common and that should be no surprise once you find out that this is how Greek expresses what English expresses with the simple I fell or I verbed. Okay, our simple past, our ED form of verbs, that is the aorist tense in Greek. So you can see that there's one box that's not filled here. If you did future time and completed aspect, you would have what's called the future perfect. I will have fallen from the point of view of some time in the future. The action will be over. You'll notice that it's small and faded here. 
because Greek does not regularly use anything that expresses this. It's just not something that the Greeks talked about very much. There are ways to do it, but it's so rare that I think in many, many years of doing Greek, I've seen it two or three times. Now, if you're a Latin student coming to Greek, this will surprise you because future perfect in Latin is very, very common. It just isn't for the Greeks. So you'll give up the future perfect in your paradigms if you're a Latin student and you'll take on the aorist. Okay, so this is tense in Greek. All tenses in Greek are a combination of time and aspect. So let's go back to our list of things that you have to know about verbs, that you will know about verbs. And you have now seen that we get present and imperfect and future and aorist and perfect and pluperfect. And I've explained just briefly, before you even get any verbs to do them with, what those are about. Greek verbs also have mood. There's indicative, which is for statements of fact. And it also is how we ask questions. So it's going to be the forms of the verb that are sort of the most normal, everyday sorts of forms um, when you're just telling true things and asking questions. And it's the first mood that we will learn. We're also going to get subjunctive and optative, which will be for things that are more speculative or might happen or um, in some other way aren't statements of fact. I'll explain those moods more when we get to them, which won't be long. We'll also get the imperative mood, which is to give commands. And we will use infinitives, and you'll learn those very soon. And that's the form of the Greek verb that is the same as our to verb form in English. And it's going to complete the meaning of some other verbs and we'll have other ways to use the infinitive and you'll learn those forms soon. We'll also get later on in the semester participles, which is a verbal adjective in Greek. And again, when we get there, I'll explain it in detail. But this is verbing. This is ing words where um, the verb idea can become an adjective. And Greek has an extensive participle system and extensively uses its participles, so it'll be very exciting when we get there. Now, that leaves one more thing in the five things that you need to think about with verbs. Tense, mood, person and number, plus voice. So, voice, we have the active voice, where the subject does whatever the verb is, so the subject verbs. We have the passive voice where whatever the verb is is being done to the subject. So the subject is verbed and we'll learn how to express that in the different tenses. Now, English has active and passive as well and you've just heard a little bit about how we use it in English. Greek has also the middle voice. We won't get there until Unit 7 in Hansen and Quinn, and I'll explain lots about it then, but just so that you know that it's coming. In that instance, in the middle voice, the subject of a verb has some special interest in that verb. So often you can translate it the subject verbs for herself, or the subject causes the verb to happen, something like that. But again, we'll get to that in much detail when we actually start learning those forms. So these are the five things that every Greek verb will have. Some pieces of it will be missing depending on the verb form, but as you learn each kind of verb, we'll address how it relates to this list of uh, items. Now, to start with, in Unit 2, Hansen and Quinn is going to have you learn four tenses. They're going to have you learn the, the, I'm sorry, the indicative mood and some infinitives in those tenses will only be in the active voice. We will learn things in first, second, and third person, and singular and plural. So that's going to be a lot in Unit 2, but then you will have a lot more that you can say with Greek sentences. Now, a little bit more. Every Greek verb has what verbs in many languages have, which is principal parts. That is, the fewest forms of that verb that you need to learn in order to be able to form all the other forms of that verb. So this is what you will get when you learn verbs in your vocabulary. You will get a list of words that looks like this. This is 
all of the principal parts for one verb. This is one of our first ones, luo, luso, elusa, leluka, lelumai, eluthain, which means free or sometimes destroy. And it has six principal parts. Greek verbs typically have six principal parts. Some of them that we'll learn in the future are missing one or two, but each of these six principal parts has specific jobs to do. And you will learn as you learn each verb form which principal part you need to make that verb correct. Every principal part in Greek is actually a first person singular verb, a first person singular indicative verb, a I do something verb. So the first principal part, and again, you don't need to know this yet. You don't need to memorize this yet. I'm just giving you a sense of what it is that is in front of you in Hanson and Quinn as you start to memorize these words. First principal part is present indicative active, I free. Second principal part is future indicative active, I will free. Third principal part is aorist indicative active, I freed. Fourth principal part is perfect indicative active, I have freed. Fifth principal part is perfect indicative passive, actually also middle, but why bother we with that now? And that is, I have been freed. And the sixth principal part is aorist indicative passive, I was freed. Now again, you're going to learn all of these things when we get to those tenses and moods. But I wanted you to see that these words actually mean something and that there's a consistent logic to what each of these principal parts does. When we actually start to learn how to make all the different forms, you will go to the principal parts and look at the end of the verb and the beginning of the verb to decide what it is that it's doing in the sentence that you have and how it matches up with all those five tense, mood, voice, person and number things that we're going to learn. So luo has a stem. The first principal part has a stem and an ending. The second principal part has a stem that's a little bit different and an ending. And you'll see that that second principal part often is changed exactly the same way that Luo's stem is changed in the second principal part. And the third principal part, you'll see that we have a change at, of the stem and the ending. And we also have a change at the beginning. A different change happens in the fourth principal part and the fifth principal part. And then it changes again in the sixth principal part. So with those little green lines, I've divided up ending and stem in the middle. And sometimes there's a prefix thing on there that tells you, that gives you other information about which principal part a verb form comes from and even some about what it's doing. For instance, the two aorist principal parts you'll notice, are the two that have epsilons on the beginning. And when we learn the aorist really soon, you'll discover that that's an important marker for past time. You'll also see that the two perfect principal parts have a sort of hiccupy beginning there where it repeats the first sound of the stem with an epsilon. That's called reduplication. And reduplication turns out to be a marker for completed aspect. So that's a little bit of um, detail for the linguistic nerds, but it also helps you identify what verb form you're looking at. So again, don't worry too much about taking all of this in now, but these are the things that the principal parts will help you see and the reasons why you need to learn all six principal parts every time you learn a new verb. That's it for the big giant Greek verb overview. And now you can go on to learning the actual present indicative active of Greek verbs.